Good morning, Riverfront. For those of you who might be just joining us for the first time this morning, I am Pastor Liza. I'm one of the three pastors here at Riverfront, and I am so happy to be with all of you this morning. Um, or I guess I could say I'm happy-ish to be with all of you this morning because I wish that it were not on Zoom. I don't know about all of you guys, but I am feeling particularly zoomed out this week. I am feeling tired of interacting with people through a computer screen. And when I see all of your faces on Sunday morning on Zoom, sometimes I just want to burst into tears because I wish so badly that I could be in person with all of you together and give you all big hugs, those of you who, who want to be hugged. Um, so I guess it's a good thing I'm pre-recording this so I don't uh, burst into tears in the middle of, of my sermon. Um, but my my guess is that a lot of you are, are feeling the same way I am. And that's why Pastor Ben and I have been preaching this series over the past few weeks called Enough Already, Finding Hope at the End of Your Rope. Because we know that we serve a God who wants to meet us right at the very end of our fraying rope. And so today, what I want to talk about is what spirituality or what um, meeting with and communing with God looks like during this time of Zoom church or YouTube church or however you are accessing church. I want to talk about remote spirituality. So lucky for us, the vast majority of the Old Testament, and Pastor Ben has talked about this too, but the vast majority of the Old Testament was written by people who were displaced from their spaces of worship and who were essentially participating in remote spirituality, who were having to reimagine where they could locate God. Ben talked about the lessons from the diaspora last week. And so I want to continue to, to talk about that a bit this week. Um, and I want to first turn to what you might think is a relatively boring piece of scripture, um, but hopefully you will see how it's actually really interesting um, once we get into it. And that is Exodus 25. So if you are following along, um, you, can, you can access it on, online or on your phone or if you have a physical Bible. Um, turn with me to Exodus 25. And this passage is talking about instructions on how to build the tabernacle. Uh, and the tabernacle was essentially this remote, portable place of worship, a portable place where the Jews believed that God dwelled. It was, it was their Zoom church, right? The tabernacle was the Jews' Zoom church. So for a little context before we get into this passage, um, this is right after Moses has just been given the Ten Commandments by God. And God is giving Moses instructions on how to build a nation. Things like laws, things like how to treat neighbors, um, things like when to celebrate annual festivals. And as part of these instructions, he, he continues on and, and says this. And this, these are instructions on how to build this tabernacle, this, this remote place of worship. Um, this is starting in verse 8, if you're following along. Exodus 25, verse 8. Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. Have them make an ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold, both inside and out, and make a gold molding around it. Cast four gold rings for it and fasten them onto its four feet with two rings on one side and two rings on the other. Then make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles into the rings on the side of the ark to carry it. The poles are to remain in the rings of this ark. They are not to be removed. Then... Put the ark, put in the ark the tablets of the covenant law, which I will give you. Make an atonement cover of pure gold, two and a half cubits long, and a cubit and a half wide. So these are very specific instructions, and we won't keep reading because I think you get the gist, but he goes on with even more specific instructions about the how to build the table 
uh, and how to build the lampstand. So very, very specific directions. So when I read this, it, it leads me to the question of why does God need a physical dwelling place in the first place, right? Isaiah 66 says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build for me? Where will my resting place be? So here God is basically saying, don't try to build me anything because the whole, the whole world is my, is my worship place, right? And that's actually one thing I love about the Bible. For any point the Bible makes, it, it often makes the opposite point somewhere else in the text. The Bible itself is constantly engaging in self-critique, which is pretty cool. So how do we reconcile these two things? How do we reconcile the, the verse in Isaiah of God saying, you don't need to build me a physical place with these very, very specific directions on a physical place of worship um, to worship God? I think what these two conflicting verses lead us to conclude is that the purpose of the tabernacle that we read about in Exodus 25 is less for God and more for Israel. It's more for the people. It's, it's a physical marker of the invisible covenant that God has made with Israel at this time. I think that's how it is with, with all of our ritualistic things, right? Baptism, communion, they are embodied symbols of the holy. They are, they are physical markers of an internal truth that's going on inside of us. But without that internal thing happening, the physical things don't really matter. But the physical things can point to an internal, internal shift or an internal truth inside of us. Well, this tabernacle is like that, and it, it is very ornate, right? One version, we read about all the gold and the, the akacha wood, um, and then one, one translation of the Bible even talks about dolphin skins, um, which was an ancient water creature. It probably wasn't what our modern-day dolphin was, but I love this idea of dolphin skins. And, you know, there's the there's Ark of the Covenant made of gold and akacha wood, and that's inside the tabernacle behind this curtain. And to the Jewish people, the Ark of the Covenant was the most holy, holy place. Um, it's where they believed God dwelled. But it's also practical, right? It is very holy, but it is also very portable. Does anybody have at work um, a, a laptop that kind of like plugs into their monitor, their permanent monitor, but then they can unplug it and bring it home so they can do work at home? Arunan has one of those uh, for the state of Connecticut. And during COVID, he was able to kind of unplug his laptop and, and bring it home um, so that he could work from home. It was kind of like that. The tabernacle was kind of like the laptop and the temple was the desktop computer, that it was, it was a permanent fixture, but then the laptop was meant to be transported back and forth. It was kind of set up to be portable. And the reason for this is because the Jewish people at this time in history, in Exodus, were in between two places, right? They, Pastor Ben talked about this last week, this, this diaspora. They were in between Egypt and not yet at the promised land. And so their worship space had to be both holy and portable, had to be holy and portable. Do you ever feel this way right now? Like you are in between two spaces. My sister lived or lives, I guess, in New York City in the Upper West Side. And her and a lot of her friends and a lot of New Yorkers left the city back in March to move home with their parents, whether it be to a vacation house or back home in the house they grew up in, um, or even with friends. My sister had a friend leave the city and come live in Connecticut with, with her for a little while. Um, and they've been doing this for the past seven months. And when Sarah first came home, in March, she brought enough clothes for exactly two weeks. And then she found out it was going to be a lot longer. And she was between spaces, right? She was kind of home in Connecticut, but all her stuff was still in New York City. A lot of us feel that way. In Huddle last week, my Huddle was talking about the anxiety that we feel as, as parents every time we pick up our phones and see an 855 number 
um, that because we know it could be an, an, a robocall from our kid's school saying, oh, school is canceled next week. Um, you have no more child care. And it kind of gives us a lot of anxiety to know that at any point, uh, those for those of us who work and are also parents, at any point, our whole lives could be blown up and we could have no child care and have to try to maintain our jobs without child care like we had to do back in March. We have some PTSD um, from what happened back then. And so we're constantly living in this in-between space of um, will I will I be able to work full time? Will I be able to uh, have child care? You know, as, as a church, we are kind of in between. We are in between spaces. We left the 224 um, in March when things shut down. And we're also potentially looking for a permanent building to purchase. And we don't know, will we go back to the 224? Will we have a permanent location to move into? We're in this in-between space of online church. We are missing our physical space. Um, but we are not yet sure what that's going to look like when we go back. We have had to shift from temple spirituality, the desktop computer, to portable spirituality, the laptop computer. And I think it's notable that for the Jewish people in this time, even though the tabernacle was portable, they still put a tremendous amount of effort into setting it up. They were incredibly intentional about creating a worship space outside of the temple that they could take with them wherever they went. And they spent a lot of effort um, and a lot of money too, and a lot of resources setting up this portable place. And so what I want to ask today, what I, what I want to explore together today is what do we need to do in our own lives so that we can take the holy with us wherever we go? Because we know that the holy is everywhere, that it is accessible to everyone, but what physical things do we need to do in our own lives um, to make that accessible to us? How do we create holy spaces and holy moments in our own homes. And I wanna talk about that in two areas. I wanna talk about our physical space and our time. So sanctity of space and sanctity of time. So first let's talk about our physical space. So if it's true that the tabernacle is not constructed for God, but it's actually constructed for Israel, what does the construction of the tabernacle teach us about ourselves? I think what it teaches us and, and what we can learn from these super specific instructions about the kind of wood and, and the kind of poles and gold and dolphin skins and, and these many chapters of, of very specific instructions about the tabernacle is that we and, and people back, back in these days were like this, and we are still like this today. We are an embodied people with senses, an embodied people with senses. Religion cannot only exist in our brains and in our heads. We have to be able to see and taste and touch and smell. And that is how we relate to God. Those of us who might have grown up in a higher church tradition tradition, maybe Anglican or Catholic, might remember the smell of incense or the physicality of kneeling, maybe on like a really uncomfortable bench, or, or maybe you got a cushion for your for your knees, um, and receiving the host every week um, and, and what the, that physical experience was. And then those of us with more evangelical, non-denominational backgrounds, we don't have those experiences, but we have other physical experiences and physical markers. Maybe it's the smell of coffee. Maybe it's taking communion with bread and grape juice. Maybe it's listening to chatter from people that we know and love. Maybe it's the lights dimming for worship and the sounds of those certain guitar chords. I'm not sure what the chords are, but Arunan tells me that all worship songs have like the same couple chords. So maybe it's the sound of that guitar chord for us. All of these things are physical cues that are telling our brain to slow down because we are entering into a holy, sacred space. 
And so now, in the absence of these physical cues, these traditional physical cues, what do we do? How do we cue our brains to tell our brains that we are in a holy space? In the absence of these cues, we have to create physical cues in our own spaces and in our own homes to remind us that we are always in the presence of holiness, right? Because theologically, we know that. We, are, we love Richard Rohr, and we always are talking about how there is no divide between the sacred and the profane, and that God is everywhere and the holy is everywhere. Theologically, we know this. But because we are an embodied people with senses, our brains don't always catch up to that theology of there being no separation between the sacred and the profane. We have to create cues for ourselves. So what does that look like? You know, it, it can be whatever works for you. Whatever works for you. I think um, of the major world religions, Christianity actually does probably the worst job at this. And I think that's something we can learn from our brothers and sisters of other faith traditions because they have a lot of physical markers that help their people remember that the holy is always among them. Jews have so many rituals like the candles that they light on Sabbath and um, the symbolic food that they eat in, in the Passover Seder. Muslims have prayer rugs in their homes to differentiate a specific place where they can pray that they'll roll out five times a day and pray on. My college roommate was Muslim, or is Muslim, and during, when we were in college, I would sometimes fast with her for Ramadan, and Muslims always break their fast after their daily fast with a fig. Sorry, not a fig, with a date. Um, and to this day, when I taste a date, it brings me back to that embodied spiritual practice and the closeness that I felt to God when I was fasting. Hindus often have little shrines in their homes called pujas, and they have food and candles set up in these spaces that give them a physical space to pray in their homes. We Christians are kind of overly obsessed with our churches, um, and we overall do a pretty bad job of making our homes holy spaces. But we have to think about how to do that now that we're not in our physical church building for many of us. So think about what you can do to mark a sacred space in your home. And this will look different for each of you. And so I don't want to give you um, a prescribed thing to do because you need to think about what that will look like for, for you. For me, um, there's a few things that work for me. I really love essential oils. Aruna makes so much fun of me because he is not a fan. Um, but I really like essential oils, and so I have certain ones that I use for quiet time, like for prayer time or for bedtime to mark for me, like, okay, this is wind down time, this is sleep time, and those smells are really powerful for me. I also see God through connecting to my community. Um, though most of you know that I live in Fro the Frog Hollow neighborhood of Hartford, so there's like always a lot of people and, and things, a lot going on um, on my street, and so... I've gone on a lot of neighborhood walks during COVID and, and seeing um, the things in my neighborhood and people have been physical markers um, to me of the divine. We, my family built, well, we didn't build, we purchased and then painted a little free library um, for our front yard. And that physical activity and that physical space um, is a space where God exists for me. It's almost like a tabernacle, right? Because it's like a little box with things in it. Um, because folks from our community, students and people just walking by will stop by and they'll chat and they'll take a book. Um, and, and that has made me feel like the sacred is coming to my home because I see God in my neighbors. Another thing that I've been doing um, is I've, I've been spending a lot more time looking out the window and noticing the seasons this year than I ever have in the past. I feel like every other year I've just kind of plowed through the seasons and I wake up one morning and I'm like, huh, it's winter. But this year I'm like really noticing in March and April when the flowers were coming on the trees and now when the leaves are falling off the trees, like I'm, I'm noticing it out my window a lot more than I ever have before. So those are just a few things for me, but what, what can you do 
to make your physical space, the space where you spend most of your time, feel like a space where you can worship, where you can see God? What physical things do your senses, your taste, your sight, your smell, your vision need to feel connected to God in your physical space? And then in addition to the sanctity of space is the sanctity of time. I think during these days of remote spirituality, there are also some things that we can do to make our time feel more sacred. Theologically, we believe that each of us, me and, and each of you, are image bearers of God. And so if we believe that, if we believe that we are image bearers of God, then our time is God's time. It's a holy thing. Another thing that the Jews do better than us, than us Christians, is carving out a specific day to devote to this, to remember that, that our time is holy and it, it is God's time. In Exodus 35, um, the, the people are commanded, have a day of solid rest to the Lord. And I think it's interesting that rest is actually, it's an active thing that you have to do. Rest isn't just like, don't, don't do anything or like go to sleep or something. It's not just the absence of work. Um, it's something that you actively have to do. For the Jewish people, their space is holy and obviously the land is holy, but time is also holy. Um, it's something that you have that no one can ever take away from you, that we all have uh, the same amount of hours in our day, right? We all have 24 hours in our day. It's this weirdly equalizing thing. And so I wonder, when is the last time that you had a good rest? And what does that mean for you? What does that mean for you to have a good rest? And what does it look like for you to demarcate sacred time? Does it mean turning off your phone? Does it mean leaving your house and getting into the woods? Does it mean taking a bath? Does it mean practicing yoga? Does it mean closing yourself in the bathroom and just taking a five minute break from your kids and a few deep cleansing breaths? It means something different for everyone. And it's so hard. I get it. It's so hard. I get kind of salty sometimes, like kind of angry when people talk to me about self-care. I kind of don't like the term self-care anymore um, because I'm like, I'm caring for four little people, right? I have four kids, ages seven and under. Like I don't have time for self-care because I have, I do too much caring for others, especially when they were home all day um, when schools were closed. So I, I get it. It's hard when you are stressed about your kids or when you are stressed about money, stressed about your finances, and maybe you have to work all the time. Maybe when you're stressed about your health. And so it's not my intention in this sermon to give you like one more thing to do or to make you feel guilty. Like, oh, this is one more area of my life where I'm, I'm failing because I don't demarcate sacred time or sacred space. If you feel, if you're sitting here and listening to this and feeling like, oh, there's no margin in my life to do any of this, to create sacred space and to create sacred time. I am right there with you and I, and I know how you feel. And I just want you to know it is not your fault. It is not your fault if you feel like there is no margin in your life. Let us help you. Let the church help you. Reach out. Allow yourself to rest and to be carried by other people. Ask for help. Please ask for help. We have a lot of ways um, that you can get help. You can, you can reach out to a pastor on our website. We have a form where you can request spiritual care um, and we will follow up with you, whether it be through prayer or through um, a, a Zoom meeting or a phone call. We have our Jericho Road Fund, which has thousands and thousands of dollars in it. So if you have something that can be solved by a, a small amount of money, please reach out to us because we have ways to help you. Sometimes um, demarcating sanctity of time means that you need to reach out and allow yourself to be carried by other people for a little while. It means sometimes saying no when you need to say no and saying yes to things that truly renew your spirit because our time is holy and it's very valuable. 
many of us, myself included, have gotten used to just like plowing through life and worshiping the false god of productivity. But that isn't serving us right now, friends. It's not. And if you've never stretched that muscle before in thinking reflectively about how to really honor God with your time, I invite you into that. I invite you to think about it about that this week because it is renewing and it is life-giving when we take back our time and realize that that it is a sacred thing. So as we move into this time of worship, I want you to spend these next few minutes as our worship band plays, thinking about uh, what you can do this week to remind yourself that your space, your physical space, and your time, those 24 hours that you have in your day, are sacred. They are, they are from God. They are God. Think about the role of ritual in your life. Because we know that God does not live in the temple. God is not stationed in that desktop computer. God does not live in the church that you grew up in or the church that you were kicked out of or in your college dorm room where you first met Jesus or in that beautiful cathedral or in the G. Fox building or the Glastonbury Community Center or the 224 or anywhere else that we have deemed to be sacred space. All spaces are sacred, and all creatures of God are sacred. But as embodied people with senses, think about what you can do to help you remember this truth, that our time and our space is sacred in this weird, weird time of remote spirituality. If you have something that has helped you with this, I am by no means an expert, so please drop it in the chat now because I think we benefit um, from, from hearing other people's ideas and hearing what has worked for other people. Um, and as we go into this time of worship, I invite you to read the things um, that people put in the chat of ways that they have demarcated sacred space or sacred time in their lives um, and draw inspiration from this as we, as we hear from God together um, and as we journey together. Go in peace, everyone.